Book Nine, Part Two of the Aeneid. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. The Aeneid by Publius Vergilius Maro, translated by John Dryden. Book Nine A, Night Thirty, A Day Assault, Part Two. But far they had not passed before they spied three hundred horse with Volsons for their guide. The queen a legion to King Turnus sent, but the swift horse the slower foot prevent. And now advancing sought the leader's tent. They saw the pair, for throw the doubtful shade, his shining helm Evrialis betrayed, on which the moon with full reflection played. "'Tis not for naught," cried Volsons from the crowd. "'These men go there,' then raised his voice aloud. "'Stand, stand, why thus in arms, and whither bent? "'From whence to whom, and on what errand sent? "'Silent they scud away, and haste their flight "'to neighbouring woods, and trust themselves to night. "'The speedy horse all passages belay, "'and spur their smoking steeds to cross their way. "'And watch each entrance of the winding wood. "'Black was the forest, thick with speech it stood, "'horrid with fern and intricate with thorn. "'Few paths of human feet or tracks of beasts were worn. "'The darkness of the shades his heavy prey, "'and fear misled the younger from his way. But Nisus hit the turns with happier haste, and thoughtless of his friend the forest passed, and Alban plains from Alba's name so called, where King Latinus then his oxen stalled. Till turning at the length he stood his ground, and missed his friend, and cast his eyes around. Ah, wretch, he cried, where have I left behind? The unhappy youth, where shall I hope to find? Or what way take? Again he ventures back, And treads the mazes of his former track. He winds the wood, and listening hears the noise Of tramping courses and the rider's voice. The sound approached, and suddenly he viewed The foes enclosing, and his friend pursued, Forelaid and taken, while he strove in vain The shelter of the friendly shades to gain. What should he next attempt, what arms employ, what fruitless force to free the captive boy? Or desperate should he rush and lose his life, with odds oppressed in such unequal strife? Resolved at length, his pointed spear he shook, and casting on the moon a mournful look. Guardian of groves and goddess of the night, fair queen, he said, direct my dart aright. If ever my pious father, for my sake, Did grateful offerings on thy altars make, Or I increased them with my sylvan toils, And hung thy holy roofs with savage spoils, Give me to scatter these. Then from his ear he poised and aimed, And launched the trembling spear, The deadly weapon hissing from the grove, Impetuous on the back of Sulmo drove pierced his thin armor, drank his vital blood, and in his body left the broken. He staggers round, his eyeballs roll in death, and with short sobs he gasps away his breath. All stand amazed, a second javelin flies, with equal strength, and quivers through the skies. This through thy temples Targus forced the way, and in the brain-pan warmly buried lay. Fierce Volsons foams with rage, and gazing round, Descried not him who gave the fatal wound, Nor knew to fix revenge, but thou, he cries, Shall pay for both, and at the prisoner flies. With his drawn sword, then struck with deep despair, That cruel sight the lover could not bear, But from his covert rushed in open view, And sent his voice before him, as he flew. Me, me, he cried, turn all your swords alone. On me the fact confessed, the fault my own. He neither could nor durst the guiltless youth 
ye moon and stars bear witness to the truth. His only crime, if friendship can offend, is too much love to this unhappy friend. Too late he speaks, the sword which fury guides, driven with full forth, had pierced his tender sides. Down fell the beauteous youth, the yawning wound, gushed out a purple stream, and stained the ground. His snowy neck reclines upon his breast, like a fair flower by the keen share oppressed, like a white poppy sinking on the plain, whose heavy head is overcharged with rain. Despair and rage and vengeance justly vowed drove Nisus headlong on the hostile crowd. Volsens he seeks, on him alone he bends, borne back and bored by his surrounding friends. Onward he pressed and kept him still in sight, then whirled aloft his sword with all his might. The unerring steel descended while he spoke, peered his wide mouth, and through his wizen broke. Dying he slew, and staggering on the plain, with swimming eyes he sought his lover slain, then quiet on his bleeding bosom fell, content in death to be revenged so well. O oh, happy friends, for if my verse can give immortal life, your fame shall ever live, fixed as the capital's foundation lies, and spread wherever the Roman eagle flies. The conquering party first divide the prey, then their slain leader to the camp convey. With wonder, as they went, the troops were filled to see such numbers whom so few had killed. Serranus, Ramnus, and the rest they found, vast crowds the dying and the dead surround. And the yet reeking blood o'erflows the ground, or knew the helmet which Mesopus lost, but mourned a purchase that so dear had cost. Now rose the ruddy morn from Teton's bed, and with the dawn of day the skies o'erspread. Nor long the sun his daily course withheld, but added colors to the world revealed, when earthly Turnus, wakening with the light, all clad in armor, calls his troops to fight. His martial men with fierce harangue he fired, and his own ardor in their souls inspired. This done to give new terrors to his foes, the heads of Nisus and his friends he shows. Raised high on pointed spears, a ghastly sight, loud peals of shouts ensue, and barbarous delight. Meantime the Trojans run where danger calls. They line their trenches, and they man their walls. In front extended to the left they stood. Safe was the right, surrounded by the flood. But casting from their towers a frightful view, they saw the faces which too well they knew. Though then disguised in death and smeared all over, with filth obscene and dropping putrid gore, soon hasty fame through the sad city bears the mournful messages to the mother's ears. An icy cold benumbs her limbs, she shakes, her cheeks the blood, her hand the web forsakes. She runs the rampires round amidst the war, nor fears the flying darts, she rends her hair, and fills with loud laments the liquid air. Thus then my loved Evrialus appears, thus looks the prop my declining years. Wast on this face my famished eyes I fed, oh, how unlike the living is the dead. And couldst thou leave me cruel thus alone, not one kind kiss from a departing son, no look, no last adieu before he went, an ill-boding hour to slaughter sent, cold on the ground and pressing foreign clay, to Latian dogs and fowls he lies a prey, nor was I near to close his dying eyes, to wash his wounds, to weep his obsequies, to call about his corpse, his crying friends, or spread the mantle made for other ends, on his dear body which I woe with care, nor did my daily pains or nightly labor spare, 
where shall i find his corpse what earth sustains his trunk dismembered and his cold remains for this alas i left my needful ease exposed my life to winds and winter seas if any pity touch rutulian hearts here empty all your quivers all your darts or if they fail thou jove conclude my woe and send me thunderstruck to shades below her shrieks and clamours pierce the Trojans' ears, unman their courage and augment their fears. Nor young Ascanius could the sight sustain, nor old Ilionius his tears restrain. But Actor and Idaeus jointly sent to bear the madding mother to her tent. And now the trumpets terribly from far, with rattling clangor, rose the sleepy war the soldiers shouts succeed the brazen sounds and heaven from pole to pole the noise rebounds the volscians bear their shields upon their head and rushing forward form a moving shed these fill the ditch those pull the bulwarks down some raise the ladders others scale the town but where void spaces on the walls appear or thin defence they pour their forces there with pools and missive weapons from afar, the Trojans keep aloof the rising war. Taught by their ten years siege defensive fight, they roll down ribs of rocks and unresisted white. To break the penthouse with a ponderous blow, would yet the patient Volscians undergo, but could not bear the unequal combat long. For where the Trojans find the thickest throng, the ruin falls their shattered shields give way and their crushed heads become an easy prey they shrink for fear abated of their rage nor longer dare in a blind fight engage contended now to gall them from below with darts and slings and with a distant bow elsewhere mesentius terrible to view a blazing pine within the trenches threw but brave Mesapus, Neptune's warlike son, broke down the palisades the trenches won, and loud for ladders calls to scale the town. Calliope, begin ye sacred nine, inspire your poet in his high design, to sing what slaughter manly Turnus made, what souls he sent below the Stygian shade, what fame the soldiers with their captain share, and the vast circuit of the fatal war for you in singing martial facts excel you best remember and alone can tell there stood a tower amazing to the sight built up of beams and of stupendous height art and the nature of the place conspired to furnish all the strength that war required to level this the bold italians join the wary trojans obviate their design with weighty stones overwhelm their troops below shoot through the loopholes and sharp javelins throw turnus the chief tossed from his thundering hand against the wooden walls a flaming brand it stuck the fiery plague the winds were high the planks were seasoned and the timber dry Contagion caught the posts it spread along, scorched and to distance drew the scattered throng. The Trojans fled, the fire pursued amain, still gathering fast upon the trembling train, till crowding to the corners of the wall, down the defence and the defenders fall. The mighty flaw makes heaven itself resound, the dead and dying Trojans strew the ground. The tower that followed on the fallen crew whelmed over their heads and buried whom it slew. Some stuck upon the darts themselves had sent, all the same equal ruin underwent. Young Lycus and Helenor only scape, saved how they know not from the steep leap. Helenor, elder of the two by birth, on one side royal, one a son of earth, whom to the Lydian king Lycumnia bare, and sent her boasted bastard to the war. 
a privilege which none but freemen share. Slight were his arms, a sword and silver shield, no marks of honour charged its empty field. Light as he fell, so light the youth arose, and rising found himself amidst his foes. Nor flight was left, nor hopes to force his way. Emboldened by despair he stood at bay, and like a stag whom all the troop surrounds, O eager huntsman and invading hounds, resolved on death, he dissipates his fears, and bounds aloft against the pointed spears. So dares the youth, secure of death and throes, his dying body on his thickest foes. But Lycus, swifter on his feet by far, runs, doubles, winds, and turns amidst the war, springs to the walls and leaves his foes behind, and snatches at the beam he first can find looks up and leaps aloft at all the stretch, in hopes the helping hand of some kind friend to reach. But Turnus followed hard his hunted prey, his spear had almost reached him in the way, short of his reins and scarce a span behind. Fool, said the chief, thou fleeter than the wind. Couldst thou presume to scape when I pursue? He said, and downward, by the feet he drew, the trembling dastard at the tug he falls, vast ruins come along, rent from the smoking walls. Thus on some silver swan or timorous hare, Jove's bird comes sousing down from upper air. Her crooked talons trust the fearful prey, then out of sight she soars and wings her way. So seizes the grim wolf the tender lamb, in vain lamented by the bleating dam. Then rushing onward with a barbarous cry, the troops of Turnus to the combat fly. The ditch with faggots filled, the daring foe, tossed firebrands to the steepy turrets throw. Ilonius, as bold as Lucetius came, to force the gate and feed the kindling flame, rolled down the fragment of a rock so right, it crushed him double underneath his weight. Two more young, Liger and Asila slow, to bend the bow, young Liger better knew. Asila's best the pointed javelin threw. Brave Caenius laid Ortigius on the plain. The victor Caenius was by Turnus slain. By the same hand, Clonius and Aetus fall, Sagar and Ida standing on the wall. From Carpus' arms his fate Privernus found, hurt by Temilla first but slight the wound. His shield thrown by, to mitigate the smart, he clapped his hand upon the wounded part. The second shaft came swift and unespied, and pierced his hand, and nailed it to his side. Transfixed his breathing lungs and beating heart, the soul came issuing out, and hissed against the dart. The son of Arcans shone amid the rest, in glittering armour and a purple vest. Fair was his face, his eyes inspiring love, bred by his father in the Martian grove, where the fat altars of Palicus flame, and send in arms to purchase early fame. Him, when he spied from far the Tuscan king, laid by the lance and took him to the sling. Thrice whirled the throng around his head and threw, the heated lead half melted as it flew. It pierced his hollow temples and his brain. The youth came tumbling down and spurned the plain. Then young Ascanius, who before this day was wont in woods to shoot the savage prey, first bent in martial strife the twanging bow and exercised against a human foe. With this bereft Numanus of his life, who Turnus' younger sister took to wife, Proud of his realm and of his royal bride, vaunting before his troops and lengthened with a stride, in these insulting terms the Trojans he defied. Twice conquered cowards, now your shame is shown, cooped up a second time within your town, who dare not issue forth in open field, but hold your walls before you for a shield. Thus threat you war, Thus our alliance force, what gods, what madness, hither steered your course. 
You shall not find the sons of Atreus here, nor need the frauds of sly Ulysses fear. Strong from the cradle of a sturdy brood, we bear our new-born infants to the flood. There bathed amid the stream our boys we hold, with winter hardened and inured to cold. They wake before the day to range the wood, kill ere they eat nor taste unconquered food. No sports but what belong to war they know, to break the stubborn colt, to bend the bow. Our youth of labor patient earn their breed, hardly they work with frugal diet fed. From ploughs and harrows sent to seek renown, they fight in fields and storm the shaken town. No part of life from toils of war is free, no change in age or difference in degree. We plough and till in arms our oxen feel, instead of goads the spur and pointed steel. The inverted lance makes furrows in the plain, even time that changes all, yet changes us in vain. The body, not the mind, nor can control, the immortal vigour or abate the soul. Our helms defend the young, disguise the grey. We live by plunder and delight in prey. Your vests embroidered with rich purple shine, In sloth you glory, and in dances join. Your vests have sweeping sleeves with female pride. Your turbans underneath your chins are tied. Go, Phrygians, to your dindimus again. Go less than women in the shape of men. Go, mixed with eunuchs in the mother's rites, where with unequal sound the flute invites. Sing, dance, and howl by turns in Ida's shade. Resign the war to men who know the martial trade. This foul reproach Ascanius could not hear, with patience or a vowed revenge forbear. At the full stretch of both his hands he drew, and almost joined the horns of the tough yew. But first before the throne of Jove he stood, and thus with lifted hands invoked the god. My first attempt, great Jupiter, succeed. An annual offering in thy grove shall bleed. A snow-white steer before thy altar led, who, like his mother, bears aloft his head butts with his threatening brows and bellowing stands and dares the fight and spurns the yellow sands joe bowed the heavens and lent a gracious ear and thundered on the left amidst the clear sounded at once the bow and swiftly flies the feathered death and hisses through the skies the steel through both his temples forced the way extended on the ground numanus lay Go now, vain boaster, and true valor scorn, the Phrygians twice subdued, yet make this third return. Ascanius said no more, the Trojans shake, the heavens with shouting and new vigor take. Apollo then bestrode a golden cloud to view the feats of arms and fighting crowd, and thus the beardless victor he bespoke aloud. Advance, illustrious youth, increase in fame, and wide from east to west extend thy name. Offspring of gods thyself, and Rome shall owe to thee a race of demigods below. This is the way to heaven, the powers divine, from this beginning date the Julian line. To thee, to them, and their victorious heirs, the conquered war is due, and the vast world is theirs. Troy is too narrow for thy name, he said, and plunging downward shot his radiant head, dispelled the breathing air that broke his flight, shorn of his beams a man to mortal sight. Old Bootus' form he took, Anchise's squire, now left to rule Ascanius by his sire. His wrinkled visage and his hoary hairs, his mien, his habit, and his arms he wears, and thus salutes the boy to forward for his years. Suffice it thee, thy father's worthy son, the warlike prize thou hast already won. The god of archers gives thy youth a part of his own praise, nor envies equal art. Now tempt the war no more, 
he said and flew, obscure in air, and vanished from their view. The Trojans by his arms their patron know, and hear the twanging of his heavenly bow. Then duteous force they use, and Phoebus' name, to keep from fight the youth to fond of fame. Undaunted they themselves no danger shun, from wall to wall the shouts and clamours run. They bend their bows, they whirl their slings around, heaps of spent arrows fall and strew the ground, and helms and shields and rattling arms resound. The combat thickens like the storm that flies from westward when the showery kids arise, or pattering hail comes pouring on the main when Jupiter descends in hardened rain or bellowing clouds burst with a stormy sound, and with an armed winter strew the ground. Pandrus and Bitsias thunderbolts of war, whom Hiera to bold Alcanor bear, on Ida's top to youth of height and size, like first that on their mother mountain rise, presuming on their force the gates unbar, and of their own accord invite the war. With fates averse against the king's command, Armed on the right and on the left they stand, And flank the passage, shining steel they wear, And waving crests above their heads appear. Thus two tall oaks that Pardus' banks adorn, Lift up to heaven their leafy heads unshorn, And overpressed with nature's heavy load, Dance to the whistling winds and at each other nod. In flows a tide of Latians when they see the gates set opened and the passage free. Bold Quercens with rash Tamarus rushing on, Equicolus that in bright armor shone, and Haemon first, but soon repulsed they fly, or in the well defended pass they die. These with success are fired, and those with rage, and each on equal terms at length engage drawn from their lines and issuing on the plain, the Trojans hand to hand the fight maintain. Fierce Turnus in another quarter fought, when suddenly the unhoped-for news was brought. The foes had left the fastness of their place, prevailed in fight, and had his men in chase. He quits the attack, and to prevent their fate, runs where the giant brothers guard the gate. The first he met, Antipatus the brave, but base begotten on a Theban slave, Sardeon's son he slew the deadly dart, found passage through his breast and pierced his heart. Fixed in the wound the Italian cornel stood, warmed in his lungs and in his vital blood. Aphidnus next and Erymantus dies, and Meropus and the gigantic size of Bitsias threatening with his ardent eyes, not by the feeble dart he fell oppressed, a dart were lost within that roomy breast, but from a knotted lance, large, heavy, strong, which roared like thunder as it whirled along. Not two bull hides the impetuous force withhold, nor coat of double mail with scales of gold. Down sunk the monster bulk and pressed the ground, his arms and clattering shield on the vast body sound. Not with less ruin than the Bayan mole, raised on the seas, the surges to control. At once comes tumbling down the rocky wall, prone to the deep the stone's disjointed fall. Of the vast pile the scattered ocean flies, black sands discolored froth and mingled mud arise. The frighted billows roll and seek the shores, then trembles Procyta, then Ischia roars. Typhius, thrown beneath by Jove's command, astonished at the flaw that shakes the land, soon shifts his weary side and scarce awake, with wonder feels the weight press lighter on his back. The warrior god the Latian troops inspired, New strung their sinews and their courage fired, but chills the Trojan hearts with cold affright, then black despair precipitates their flight. When Pandarus beheld his brother killed, the town with fear and wild confusion filled, he turns the hinges of the heavy gate with both his hands and adds his shoulders to the weight. 
some happier friends within the walls enclosed, the rest shut out to certain death exposed. Fool as he was, and franting in his care, to admit young Turnus and include the war. He thrust amid the crowd, securely bold, like a fierce tiger pent amid the fold. Too late his blazing buckler they descry, and sparkling fires that shoot from either eye his mighty members and his ample breast his ratting armour and his crimson crest far from that hated face the trojans flee all but the fool who sought his destiny mad pandarus steps forth with vengeance vowed for Beatia's death and threatens thus aloud these are not Ardea's walls, nor his the town. Armata proffers with Lavinia's crown. Tis hostile earth you tread, of hope bereft. No means of safe return by flight are left. To whom with countenance calm and soul sedate, Thus Turnus, then begin and try thy fate. My message to the ghost of Priam bear, Tell him a new Achilles sent thee there. A lance of tough ground ash the Trojan threw, Rough in the rind and knotted as it grew. With his full force he whirled it first around, But the soft yielding air received the wound. Imperial Juno turned the course before, And fixed the wandering weapon in the door. But hope not thou, said Turnus, when I strike, to shun thy fate, our force is not alike, nor thy steel tempered by the Lemnian god. Then rising on his outmost stretch he stood, and aimed from high the full descending blow, cleaves the broad front and beardless cheeks in two. Down sinks the giant with a thundering sound, his ponderous limbs oppress the trembling ground. Blood, brains, and foam gush from the gaping wound. Scalp, face, and shoulders the keen steel divides, and the shard visage hangs on equal sides. The Trojans fly from their approaching fate, and had the victor then secured the gate, and to his troops without unclosed the bars, one lucky day had ended all his wars. But boiling youth and blind desire of blood pushed his fury to pursue the crowd. Hamstring behind, unhappy Gigas died, then Phalaris is added to his side. The pointed javelins from the dead he drew, and their friends' arms against their fellows threw. Strong Harlus stands in vain, weak Phlegus flies, Saturnia still at hand, new force and fire supplies. Then Harlus, Britannus, Alcander fall, engaged against the foes who scaled the wall. But whom they feared without they found within, but whom they feared without they found within. At last, though late, by Lynceus he was seen. He calls new succors and assaults the prince, but weak his force and vain is their defense. Turned to the right his sword the hero drew, and at one blow the bold aggressor slew. He joins the neck, and with a stroke so strong, the helm flies off and bears the head along. Next him the huntsman Amicus he killed, in darts in Venkond and in poison skilled. Then Cletus fell beneath his fatal spear, and Cretius, whom the muses held so dear, he fought with courage, and he sung the fight. Arms were his business versus his delight. The Trojan chiefs behold with rage and grief their slaughtered friends and hasten their relief. Bold Menestus rallies first the broken train, whom brave Serestus and his troop sustain. To save the living and revenge the dead, against one warrior's arms all Troy they led. O, oh, void of sense and courage, Menestus cried, where can you hope your coward heads to hide? Ah, where beyond these rampires can you run? One man, and in your camp enclosed you shun. Shall then a single sword such slaughter boast, And pass unpunished from a numerous host? Forsaking honour and renouncing fame, Your gods, your country, and your king you shame. 
This just reproach their virtue does excite. They stand, they join, they thicken to the fight. Now Turnus doubts, and yet disdains to yield, but with slow paces measures back the field, and inches to the walls where Tiber's tide, washing the camp, defends the weaker side. The more he loses, they advance the more, and tread in every step he trod before. They shout, they bear him back, and whom by might they cannot conquer, they oppress with weight. As compassed with a wood of spears around, the lordly lion still maintains his ground, grins horrible, retires, and turns again, threats his distended paws, and shakes his mane. He loses while in vain he presses on, nor will his courage let him dare to run. So Turnus fares, and unresolved of flight, moves tardy back, and just recedes from fight. Yet twice in rage the combat he renews, twice breaks, and twice his broken foes pursues. But now they swarm, and with fresh troops supplied, come rolling on and rush from every side. Nor Juno, who sustained his arms before, dares with new strength suffice the exhausted store. For Joe, with sour commands sent Iris down to force the invader from the frighted town. With labor spent no longer can he wield the heavy fanchion or sustain the shield. O'erwhelmed with darts which from afar they fling, the weapons round his hollow temples ring. His golden helm gives way with stony blows, battered and flat and beaten to his brows. His crest is rashed away, his ample shield is falsified, and round with javelins filled. The foe now faint, the Trojans overwhelm, and Menestus lays hard load upon his helm. Six sweet succeeds, he drops at every pore, with driving dust his cheeks are pasted o'er. Shorter and shorter every gasp he takes, and vain efforts and hurtless blows he makes. Plunged in the flood, and may the waters fly, the yell of God, the welcome burthen bore, and whipped the sweet and washed away the gore, then gently wafts him to the farther coast, and sends him safe to cheer his anxious host. End of Book Nine of the Eneid Read by Lars Rolander